Okay, thank you, Doug. Yes, thank you, Doug. Go ahead. Are we good now? Okay. Yes, technology is always an ongoing thing because of where we are now and 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 changing how our internet habits are and our capabilities. So hopefully this all goes as expected today. Since I'm coming to you from my home, we are still on on telework, but still seeking to serve the public and let people know what's going on uh, with a variety of issues. And, and Doug was correct. I mean, you could put your own, I won't say disaster, but own issue in there because we do have a variety of issues. Not all bad, some actually good, um, especially on the ag side this spring, but we got plenty to talk about. So let's, let's get rolling here and get moving along here. Um, again, reminder of all of our partners who are Okay, there we go. There we go. Uh, of all the partners who are involved here, uh, federal partners, state partners, all across the region, um, an excellent group of people in climate services all across the Midwest, Great Plains, willing to share their time. Uh, it's always a, it's a busy, but when you're doing when you're doing the, the the presenting, it's a busy time, but fun to get emails and talk to people about a wide variety of things. We could probably do half an hour on. Uh, a number of different states just on issues going on in different states. Uh, our next webinar is June the 18th. Uh, Dr. Aaron Wilson from the Ohio State Climate Office will be our presenter for that one. Uh, and uh, you can find these webinars at those links below uh, when you can come back and get them later. So our usual agenda, uh, we're gonna touch on some current conditions of where we've been for the last month and uh, last 30 days because our, our webinar is as late as it will ever be during the month, on the third Thursday of the month, this is as late as that can be. We'll touch on a bunch of impacts on the hydro side, ag, snow, water, other along the way, a little bit of freezing issues we've had uh, because of a, a double barreled freeze. We'll take a look at the outlooks uh, for La Nina. Um, we need to getting some conversation now. Uh, we'll address that later. Definitely what's gonna go on from the next 30, 90 days. Uh, puts us through summer, and then we'll we'll drop in something on the NOAA hurricane outlook. Not as directly related to us here, but you know it's 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 part of our, our NOAA partnership, so we will share. A uh, picture here was from mid-April. It looks like a more of a January. It should be a January photo, but that's one of the cold issues we've had here recently. Okay, review on our current conditions where we are. Uh, Going to look at April temperatures first, and. Uh, Pretty clear what uh, what happened in April. We had cooler than average across all, almost all of our region except for the far southwest, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas. Otherwise, everybody was was not extreme. Uh, the coldest is uh, looks like uh, uh, South Dakota at 26. Well, actually, Kentucky was at 20th, uh, but a lot of top 35 ish numbers. So on the cold side overall for April which had some interesting, uh, you know, while, while typically colder than average April is not as good thing, it did have some benefits to us. We'll talk about that a little bit later. From a precipitation standpoint, uh, kind of a, 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 a bit of a shift, and we'll talk more about this here in a second, a little bit longer. The plain states all on the low side, some teens top six in Colorado and Nebraska, very dry Aprils. Uh, had some good points and some bad points related to that. Indiana also dry, uh, where a few of our other places were a little bit on the higher side, but really no place in our region that was above average for April. A very dry April had some good aspects from the uh, uh, from the ag side, uh, but then some dryness starting to set in because of that too. Last 30 days, we go to February through April. Remember, April was on the on the cold side. Really shows the contrast of how warm. Uh, February and March were that we had, uh, you know, numbers that were in the, in, in the top 30 warmest uh, all across the region, uh, top 25 or so as you get further, uh, you know, further east out to Ohio and uh, and, and Michigan. So the, the February and April, or excuse me, February and March were much warmer than average, allowed April to be cooler, and then we still ended up being much warmer than average overall. Uh, just pointing out Florida warmest uh, on record, just uh, from a contrast standpoint. Uh, the contrast in precipitation for February through April is pretty much much more stark than it was in the just April one. 
Again, the plain states all on the dry side, uh, uh, North Dakota coming at top five, number five, and some top 20s in several states. Whereas you get over into the eastern areas, uh, slightly above to above average. Uh, Tennessee coming in at the wettest February through April on record. Uh, and, uh, Kentucky at number 10, it would appear to be. So much wetter on the eastern side, much drier on the western side. Because we are so late in the month, I want to touch on the last 30 days because there's another, another context to add to this, the things we're going to talk about. Uh, looking at uh, what we've had in the way of precipitation, this would be from you know, April 20th until the present. Uh, the amount of precipitation, again, still relatively dry, less than two inches over much of the northwestern part of our area. Uh, it, and on the lower right-hand side, the percent of normal loss of this area is uh, less than half of average, some places less than 25% of average, while the east is, is actually uh, wetter than average from Missouri up to Michigan and parts of Ohio. Uh, we'll address that in some of the issues as, we've gone, as we're going along here. And this doesn't actually capture quite, uh, I think this does capture some of the recent heavy rainfalls in some of the eastern part of the region. Temperature-wise, we continue that colder than average that was in April uh, on into the early part of, of May. Uh, so, you know, as much as six to eight or plus degrees below average as we get up around the Great Lakes area and then on down to the eastern Corn Belt, whereas the, the western plains have actually been closer to average and slightly warmer than average out in the Colorado and Wyoming area. And uh, some of the numbers coming out of Colorado, especially parts of Colorado, uh, quite warm already for this time of year already um, because of some, some lack, of, of, uh, lack of snow out there, some lack of precipitation has allowed them actually to be quite warm uh, compared to some of the other places to the east. And setting in some drought issues we'll talk about as we go along here. So that kind of sets the stage for where we have been and to talk about some of the issues that we're going to, to look at here as we're going along. Um, mentioned you know, some of the wetter, air, wetter areas of the Eastern Corn Belt. Uh, there was a dry enough period that uh, corn plant, or that most planting has gone fairly well. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But you can see there, you know, this is a more current image from Ohio where we have uh, water standing in a field that is causing some more problems to already planted, uh, already planted crops. Okay, where are we from a soil moisture standpoint? Um, we, uh, this is a, a product called Leaky Bucket Model, just the number it's called, of soil moisture from NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. The idea of it is just to kind of give you an overall perspective in the way of where we are in soil moisture. It is uh, not a detailed model, but it gives you a general idea of what's going on. So the anomalies here are the greenest areas uh, are in millimeters, so you divide those by 25 to get inches. Uh, the wettest areas are up to, you know, maybe three to four inches above average. Those areas that are in the eastern Corn Belt have seen some of that heavier rainfall. And you actually see some of the soil moisture uh, amounts from Colorado up to Nebraska and Iowa being slightly below average. We've dried out enough there that uh, we are starting to see some below average numbers up there. And that drying out is what we're showing in the lower right-hand side of how much change there has been uh, basically since the start of because they're considered growing season, which is the end of February, March 1, how much drying out there has been, especially over the plains. Uh, and that was really necessary for agriculture to move in that area because we've been talking about wetness and potential for flooding uh, all through the winter and even into the early spring. And uh, that didn't pan out. Why didn't it pan out? Well, because we've had dry conditions and soils have dried out. So farmers were able to make progress. And uh, from a hydrology standpoint, really not a whole lot to talk about in the flood. We'll talk about that a bit more as we go along, at least on the east, on the western side. On the eastern side, we have a whole whole different set of situ situations. So uh, to that end, seven-day average stream flow or a USGS partner product of what's happening. So remember here, green is in the middle of the distribution. Uh, light blue is 76 to 90th percentile. The blue, the, the, the royal blue is greater than 90th percentile. So fairly uh, high stream flows comparatively much of the eastern part of the Corn Belt. A uh, little less uh, as you go in between the Dakotas, especially eastern Dakotas, 
we have fairly high stream flows. And even only in the driest areas, say out in Colorado and Western Kansas, do we see some stream flows falling onto the dry side already. Uh, none here, well, I guess there is one, it looks like in, in Illinois, still at the, at the highest on record. Um, so we've talked a bit about precipitation, talked about what's happening in the soil. One of the issues we, we, we don't talk enough about is how that drying occurs on the soil and how much evaporation or transpiration from growing crops or growing plants that we get. And this is an, an example of that. This is called Eddy. Uh, the link is down below. It's a NOAA product, a remotely sensed product. And, and basically saying places where it's in blue we're on the wetter side because there's not been as much evaporation across the surface. Um, out in the white area, it's kind of the middle of the road and see there's some, some atmospheric demand or more trying to evaporate water from the surface uh, that has been occurring out in that area. This is over the last 30 days. So this kind of fits with the whole situation. Less evaporation, more water going into the soil on the eastern part, western part, some drying overall. Um, uh, and a bit more than average, depending on the time frame you're looking at. Uh, here's another version of looking at that uh, through, uh, this is data from, from our partners at the University of Illinois, Illinois State Water Survey, their warm network. And the data was put together by uh, Trent Ford, the Illinois State Climatologist. And we're using, basically we're trying to estimate another thing called evapotranspiration, how much water is evaporating from the surface, and how much is transpiring through crops. And that's, that's done using uh, some atmospheric uh, parameters from temperature, humidity, wind, and solar radiation that are incorporated in this. It's called a penman Monte. We don't need to go into much detail, but it's trying to estimate how much is being drawn away from the surface by the atmosphere. And over in their area, all these show up. The blue lines are either close to the, the, the average or below recent averages, so less water coming away from that surface. Uh, we don't have a graphic for it, but we have data from, from Nebraska. And on the contrast, they've been running above average. So you've seen the drier conditions out there, we're evaporating more water from that surface drying out a bit more quickly. Uh, other part of the, as, as you look further west on what's happening and what's on the surface, is where we are in the way of snow on the ground. Uh, snow water equivalent, how much liquid is, is in each one of these basins. And uh, scale is over here on the left. Our usual scale, the bluer it is, the more water there is, the redder it is, the less there is. So the area we're focusing on is, is this part of uh, uh, Montana and Wyoming. So uh, northern Montana is still a fair amount above average, comparatively 120, 150% of average. Uh, get down to southern Montana, not quite as much. And then you get into northern Wyoming, um, they're falling below average. And then as you get, it gets a little bit worse as you go further south. So, Monta you know, a little bit in Montana uh, and Wyoming is closer to average up around kind of the Yellowstone area there. Uh, snow water content, Colorado is starting to, 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 to dry out a bit more. And this tells us what's going to be happening in the way of adding water to, uh, to uh, at least, uh, you know, up in Montana how much is going into the Missouri River and into the reservoirs and the lower, as you get down to Colorado, what's happening into the Platte River. And uh, we're running a little bit above average, but here's where the Army Corps of Engineers, where it puts that above uh, Fort Peck. Um, the, the blue is where we are this year compared to the red line. And uh, right now above Fort Peck, we're about 98% of average. So close to average by this point. Uh, for Garrison, uh, we're at about 85%, so we're a little bit lower at this point. So the you know the word from the Corps of Engineers is they they feel confident of uh, being able to handle anything that comes down at them. We are starting to melt out a bit more quickly. Uh, temperatures finally start to warm up out in that area, um, but we're going to be should be able to handle it. They don't and uh, the recent dryness, especially in the plains, there's not going to be as major contributions there. If we go to the, the North Platte and South Platte, uh, you know, we're looking at 49% of the snow water equivalent in the North Platte, 56 in the South Platte uh, that are, that are of, of remaining. So again, no, no major issues are expected out in this area unless something really, really large happens along the way. 
just to throw in a couple more graphics of where we're, these were some some late additions from the river forecast centers on some of the places that are, are potentially having issues over the next seven days or currently and and most of these are more focused in the eastern part of, of the region uh, on the lower right hand side here indiana and ohio uh, you know minor flood maybe a little bit of moderate flood over the next seven days because of recent rainfalls and a little bit more rainfall possibly to come uh, michigan and oh in, in northern illinois are the places in the mississippi river basin uh, that are that are having some issues there. Um, these are partially leading into the Great Lakes. Uh, we've talked about Great Lakes, re you know, regularly. Uh, not going to spend too much time on them this time around because uh, the story is roughly the same. We have fallen a little bit below some of the record levels. Uh, you know, Superior and Huron has ticked up, being closer to regular to 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 record levels. Uh, St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario are somewhat below, but still well above average for this time of year. And the recent rainfalls in those areas, uh, you know, in, in Michigan and partially Illinois are going to drain into the, the, the Great Lakes and keep them at these high levels as we're going along here. Hey, Dennis, can you go Here's back, please? Yes. Dennis, can yes. you go back? Thank you. Um, I, whoops, uh, to the Great Lakes. There you go. So just very quickly, um, the uh, you can see there in May uh, you might uh, point out where May is on all these graphics for each of the um, the lakes uh, they won't reach their peak for another another month or two in terms of their re, re, their seasonal cycle uh, and the records are those black bars uh, across the top for each month. So we're used, those are the records. Those aren't just high water. That's record high water. So you'll see on a number of different uh, lakes that there is the anticipation of reaching record levels and staying there for, for quite a while. The average average, I guess you could say, um, are those dots. So we're going we're gonna to be above average for quite a while. Thus, all the things, if you've heard anything, um, there's quite a bit of damage going on and other issues in the Great Lakes. Um, and I, the other reason I interrupted um, is that we're planning another Great Lakes focused webinar, let's say in a month or so, uh, co some, somewhat coinciding with some of these record level uh, record level forecasts, or sorry, yeah, record record levels, uh, never been higher. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And um, sorry, Dennis, to interrupt you. That's okay, Doug. I know you will. So, yeah, in Ontario, not quite as bad, but most of all the upper lakes are close to or, or at, at record levels. Thank you for, for pointing out, because we wanted to point out those those dots in the middle are, are the averages. Everything's running above average, and, and the Great Lakes don't change on a dime. So they're going to hang with us for a while here. On the Missouri River side, uh, the only places that are really showing much of anything right now are the James River in South Dakota, which is still draining, relatively wet area. Flat River takes a while to dry off. Southeast South Dakota and a, a few more wet areas in the south that are more that are not that are somewhat soil moisture and then some some recent convective rainfalls that are down in that area. So, but. The dry areas, most of the rest of the areas, most of the rest of the streams in the Missouri River Basin, no issues uh, to speak of at this point. To and, kind of, and I'm sorry, bring those sorry, off. Dennis. Yeah. That was a long. That was a three-month projection as opposed to some of the other ones. So that doesn't mean all those places that have red or orange dots are in flood now. Some of them are the James River, uh, for example. Uh, all those lower basin, uh, if you will, oranges and reds are. Uh, or have a higher risk of reaching minor moderate um, for all those reasons Dennis just mentioned. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. All right. Jump into the drought monitor. Um, largely what you would expect, most of the eastern part of our region, really nothing to, to be concerned about in the way of drought. Oddly enough, we'll talk about the Michigan situation here in a little bit. This area of Michigan that has had some flooding uh, was at D0 recently, as recently as last week on the U.S. drought monitor. Uh, a bit more D0 as you get over into uh, Minnesota, Iowa, down into Nebraska, Kansas, 
and then uh, a lot more issues as we get into southeastern Colorado and western Kansas where we have some introduction of D3 extreme drought, uh, long-standing dryness that is manifesting itself here, and a little bit of D1 moderate drought up in North Dakota this time around. So, um, you know, the, the dryness finally is reaching a point out here. While it had been positive, the dryness is reaching a point now where it, it's showing up in, in some fairly significant impacts in some of these regions. Uh, you know, we're going to see this in, in some of our wheat and rangeland uh, issues down in Colorado, Kansas. Uh, not too much showing up in North Dakota yet, but there is some rangeland potential problems up there. Uh, the dryness is not quite as significant uh, at that point. Uh, speaking of that southeast Colorado area, this is a, we're going to dive into some agriculture issues here. Uh, this is from Southeast Colorado, an image from uh, from uh, a, a partner there through the Colorado State Climate Office of what conditions look like. And this is, you know, this is before we get into the main part of summer in that area. So we have some issues showing up down in this region. Okay, just to run through a few crop situations here and hit some highlights. Winter wheat issues uh, up at the left-hand side is where we are in, in percent headed, where we are in progress. The brown areas were all behind. The cooler temperatures have put uh, winter wheat behind uh, in its development. Conditions are generally pretty good. That's what we're in the, the percent good to excellent in the lower left-hand side here, except for a few places. Uh, again, that Colorado, Kansas area where wheat is, is showing some of the problems of drought, also showing some problems with the freezing conditions we're going to talk about here in a little bit, and uh, down in Missouri and and uh, Arkansas. Otherwise, eastern Corn Belt winter wheat conditions are not took a little bit of a hit from the freeze, but not too bad overall. Uh, corn progress. Uh, corn and beans have very similar situations. The uh, the percent emerged in the top and the percent uh, planted in the bottom. Uh, Western Corn Belt doing better in the way of emergence. The drier conditions, a little bit warmer, have allowed corn to be planted quite early and to emerge. The eastern corn belt, pretty decent amount planted, still ahead of average, but still sitting in the ground because the temperatures have been colder in that area. Uh, a couple of the outliers in this whole situation are Missouri, where it's uh, been wetter than Missouri and they've not been able to make progress. And North Dakota, really only 1% emerged in the way of corn up there cold, wet conditions. In fact, we still have six, uh, last report, 6% of last year's corn that still had not been harvested. Um, so likely going to have some issues with not getting things planted this year and having to collect prevent plant insurance, part of their insurance pro issue. Soybeans, a uh, very similar situation, though the Eastern Corn Belt has shown some, uh, a little bit better progress in the way of emergence comparatively. Um, that did work against their advantage and uh, work against them in the freeze because of the freezing condition. Uh, but that's where we are in the way of soybeans. And then we threw a few other ones in just for grins. These are, are smaller acreage uh, oats. We have the left hand side spring wheat, wheat that's planted in the spring. Uh, similar conditions, slow to get things moving because of cold, wet conditions. Sugar beets, slow to being planted in the lower left hand side. And then a few sunflowers. Um, not as much impact on those because those are not planted until a bit later, need a little bit warmer temperatures overall. Um, I mentioned from the rangeland side of showing what the impact we, we're getting. We don't have a lot of time to be able to dive into this, but um, grass cast is a, uh, is a USDA project uh, by the Northern Plains Climate Hub with partners at the Drought Mitigation Center and uh, other partners in development. Um, the link there, you can go at grasscast.unl.edu to find out more about it. What these maps show, the whole idea of grasscast is to be able to take current rangeland conditions and then use outlooks to assess what the productivity is likely to be uh, through the year. So the left-hand side is where we are right now and how much productivity if we were wetter than average through the summer. Uh, the center one is where we are right now and we're near normal through the end of summer. And on the right-hand side, if we were below normal, and our usual usual uh, color scale applies here, so that if we're dry, we have lots of problems. But I wanted to point out this southeast Colorado area and part of Kansas, a little bit in Nebraska and Wyoming, that even if we're above normal, there's been damage done to rangeland. So rangeland productivity is not going to be very good, even if we had decent rainfalls. 
and we have a larger area, but even if we have near normal, we're going to have some problems. So there's been some damage done between the freeze and the drought in that area. If you want more information, go check that out and, and, and uh, get more information that way. Um, some other various ag issues, largely ahead of average uh, in the way of planting. The dry conditions were sufficient um, that we were able to get things in quite quickly, made quick work of corn and soybean planting. I mentioned Missouri and North Dakota being the two outliers with North Dakota still trying to cover, deal with last year's issues. Um, the recent heavy rains, in addition to the flooding uh, in, you know, in Illinois, Michigan, and Ohio, which we've alluded to and we'll talk more about here in a second, um, could you know, get, we may get some uh, need for replanting of crops that are in those areas. Also may lead to a, an additional nutrient flush that will add to the, the, some of the Great Lakes, um, Great Lakes um, uh, nutrient issues, um, harmful algal blooms is kind of what I was trying to come up with there. Okay, we're gonna take a quick dive uh, through a few more slides in the way of uh, something we had. And if you wanna hear more about this, we're gonna talk about more about this with our NOAA partners tomorrow on a national basis uh, because of our double-barreled freeze events. The last webinar we had was right at the end of freeze we had in mid-April. And then we had another one in mid-May. The dates here, you know, 12th to 18th of April and 8th to 12th of May. Uh, very interesting combination. One, because there are two of them that were quite severe. The one April was extremely cold. We had teens and even single digits out in the plains. Freezing conditions were down well into the Ohio Valley. Um, these were not, uh, that freeze was not late, but we had early dormancy break. We'll show you that on the next slide. Uh, the second set in, in May was not as cold, but you know, quite late in especially our eastern area. Uh, and, and we had a lot of things actively growing and put in the ground. So that caused some of the, the issues um, uh, that, that we will talk about here in just a second. Um, on, the, on the right hand side, this gives you an idea back in April, the, brown, the, the reddish area was places where you had leaf out ahead of average. So we had even up into the Eastern Corn Belt and, and parts of the, the rest of the Midwest, we had leaf out starting by mid-April when that, that freeze was occurring. Uh, and here's uh, you know, what drove that was the warmer than average conditions we talked about already in, in February and March. Uh, the northern areas were still, you know, not much had happened. The colder temperatures had really slowed things down overall. If you look ahead at where we were in May, you know, we had leaf out all the way through up around the Great Lakes, but instead of being ahead of average, the blue area indicates we were you know, a week, two weeks behind the average. Uh, by the time that freeze came around in May. So the, the, this, the, the colder temperatures kept some of the phenology uh, in check, kept them a little bit slower, so they weren't quite as far enough along. So that only the more hardy things were, were experiencing the cold. Uh, but the, you know, we'd had dormancy break long ahead in the, the uh, Eastern Corn Belt. So this May one did quite a bit of damage to a wide variety of crops. Um, we mentioned winter wheat already, uh, the cold in the plains. Uh, we had enough winter wheat in the central to southern plains, far enough along there was damage in that area. The eastern uh, corn belts, uh, the winter wheat in the eastern corn belt was not quite far enough along, a little bit of damage, but doesn't appear to have been too bad over in that area. The more widespread damage uh, was likely to our specialty crop, uh, our specialty crops uh, all, across, all across the region, really, all the way from Colorado, some up in the Northern Plains, but then especially over in the Eastern area. Uh, the worst one we've heard of, Western Slope Peaches in Colorado, um, as much as 90, 95% damaged in that area because of the extreme cold. Um, lots of issues in the Eastern Corn Belt with tree fruits seem to be the, the what were hurt worst. Peaches, apricots, um, you know, apples. Apples variety, well, seem to be variety dependent, earlier ones, were heard a bit more than some of the later ones. Um, you know, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, I, some in Iowa too. Iowa doesn't seem to have been hit quite as bad. Vegetables hadn't been planted yet, though there was a report of 9,000 peppers from one place in Ohio that were frozen. Uh, sweet corn that had been put in the ground in the Eastern Corn Belt, some of the earlier planted stuff was hit pretty hard. Um, later planted one, you know, still, still was not too badly along. 
And then uh, grapes was a variety of impacts. It seems like wine grapes, except for the Southern Ohio area, did okay. There were a report of juice grapes in Michigan that were hit because of that. And here's a picture of, of some of the apple damage in, in uh, Berrien County, Michigan, um, you know, that we were late enough and cold enough in that, at that May timeframe. You know, some of the damage was mitigated because uh, especially commercial growers do use freeze mitigation, but the situation we we're dealing with was cold enough and not a typical freeze situation that we weren't able to mitigate that in all cases. So lots of damage reported still being developed. Okay, come on. Okay, uh, additional crops. Uh, there was some small grain damage and cover crop damage in Northern Plains. Uh, it was early enough up there that we were still okay. Uh, row crops, mostly unaffected. Corn, uh, if it hasn't, there's some corn that was emerged was looked, probably looked pretty bad, but uh, as long as the growing point is low ground, they were going to be okay. There were some soybeans uh, from, from Illinois that were early planted. There's been a big push recently towards early planting of soybeans to increase yield. This is one of the downsides of trying to do that when you catch a late freeze. Uh, and so once soybeans are emerged, uh, if they hit a freeze, they're probably done, and that's the situation we saw here. Okay, touch on a couple major events here. Uh, again, snow in Ohio in May, not what we'd expect to see, but, but was, was there. Um, so to touch on flooding here, this is, a, 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 again, a NOAA product of radar estimated, uh, their AHAPS product. Uh, the scale is backwards from our climatological scale usually. The reddest areas are in the five to six inch rainfall areas. Uh, brown or in four. You can see what Chicago had in parts of uh, Northeast Illinois, what Michigan had that caused some of their issues, and then some of the issues in Ohio and parts of Kentucky where we had some, some, some of the extreme rainfalls. So uh, Michigan, uh, near Midland, Michigan, led to two dam breaks, uh, where last I'd seen was they had evacuated 11,000 people and, and apparently had done so very effectively uh, that there were no injuries and, and no deaths. Uh, unfortunately, there's also a chemical facility, a large chemical facility that would be uh, in the path of this flooding. Uh, this is the, uh, the hydrograph showing the peak was at just over 35 feet, which is a little bit over a foot over the record, the previous record. Uh, did not make quite as much as they were projecting it to. When you get to these extreme amounts, it's, it's very difficult sometimes to project what they were supposed to be uh, producing. Uh, Chicago flooding happened a couple days before. Uh, lots of issues around the Chicago area, uh, street flooding, uh, some interstates flooded, a um, couple tornadoes in this situation, lots of stream flows. Uh, I think there was uh, one stream flow record set on the Des Plaines River, and I think the Illinois River was going to be projected to be close to record stage a little further downstream. Uh, interesting statistic I will throw in here quickly. Pointed out by uh, again Trent for the Illinois State climatologist, May May average uh, rainfall is 3.68 inches. Um, with the rainfall now, uh, Chicago is uh, around eight inches for the month, so they've set a record already, and so that a bit of a month to go already. And the interesting thing is May precipitation has set records each of the last three years. The record was set in 18, broken last year in 19, and will be broken again this year in 2020. Um, interesting statistic. If you project that out, that doesn't say well for next year. So we're not going to be doing anything like that. Okay, jump into the outlooks now. Talked about overall conditions and what the outlooks can bring for us moving ahead. So we'll talk about, again, La Nina, El Nino status. There's a little bit more to talk about from that setting. Uh, seven day precipitation forecast, eight to 14 day. June and the summer growing season, and then we'll just mention where we are on the way of hurricanes. Uh, the El Nino La Nina status is still officially in neutral status, uh, and the probability of that is the highest as we look out through the rest of the growing season, even into the fall. These again are the probabilities for La Nina, which is the blue, probability for neutral, or for neutral which is the gray, and the probability for El Nino, which is the red. Uh, see, the probability of going back towards El Nino conditions is quite small, and that all the way through the growing season, neutral forecast 
is the most likely. There has been a fairly sharp turn in the way of subsurface uh, water towards colder subsurface water in the area of the Pacific we're looking at, which is uh, given people a, a reason to look at this a bit more closely and look at when if we might be heading towards La Nina conditions. Uh, some of the models do take sharp turns towards La Nina, so it is, does bear watching. We still don't think it, it would transition quickly enough to have an impact on the growing season here. It becomes more of an issue as we get into fall and to next winter. Okay, next seven day precipitation, where are we? Um, this is uh, the, the, uh, where we are, and I didn't update the time on this. I apologize. This should be 7 a.m. Uh, today through 7 a.m. next Thursday. Uh, the plane gets back more active with a couple, two to three inches more possible throughout the southern to central plain. This, as you remember, is some of the dry areas uh, and would be good though unfortunately it doesn't catch some of the worst areas of western Kansas and Colorado. Some rainfall possible out there, but, uh, but less likely uh, as it is into eastern Nebraska, eastern Kansas, and, and Oklahoma. There will be some benefit to this in some of the dry areas. We do have some dry areas, if you remember D0 in Nebraska and Iowa, which it will be beneficial for. The other positive aspect is the eastern Corn Belt, which has been wetter, I uh, was expecting, you know, maybe an inch to an inch and a half out of this. Again, don't treat these as gospel, but lighter amounts, which is a positive in that area. 8 to 14 day, uh, we do on the temperature side, slightly more likely, not a strong indication to be warmer than average. Um, much bigger chance out west and, and in the northeast. We're in kind of a transition area, lesser chance, but but somewhat of a chance of warmer. Uh, late May into early June, a uh, little higher chance wetter to the east, a little higher chance of drier to the west. These are only slight probabilities, so don't bank on that too much uh, overall. I would say at this point, uh, precipitation-wise, we're kind of running a middle of the road as we're going at this point. Okay, June, temperature and precipitation, where are we? Uh, this is, you're going to show, you're going to see this in the way of temperature in the, the summer. We'll give you a little advance notice there. A large area of EC, equal chances. Um, trend during the summertime and La Nina, stat, uh, La Nina, El Nino status really give us not many indications in the way of temperature. The only place is the far eastern Corn Belt and Great Lakes where we lean towards warm slightly more. So not too much to say there. Um, June and summer do have, do lean towards being wetter than average slightly higher chance of being wetter than average throughout a good portion of our area. Uh, plains and, and not as much Eastern Corn Belt, but definitely up through the Plains and, and Midwest. So the dry areas, that's a good thing. The already wet areas, not as good a news, uh, but uh, again, this is not a strong probability. Jump ahead to the three months, uh, very similar pattern, though the, the wet area does increase a bit more. And you do see hints of, of dryness uh, in the far western part of their area. This does bear watching uh, because of uh, the current dryness out there. So we'll have to keep a close eye on that as we go along. Okay, leading that to a drought outlook, basically what you would expect here, this dry area, you know, as we get into summertime, you know, the, the, the western plains area here, this is about their peak precipitation time. So if you haven't had precip by this time, it's gonna be hard to catch up too much as we go along. That's why the drought is more likely to, to, to ex, uh, continue out there. Uh, this area for possible improvement in Kansas is probably more likely due to what is gonna be happening over the next week or so, uh, I would ex expect at this point. Right now, no indications on drought development in the rest of the Corn Belt. There probably will be some small areas along the way. There always are every year. It's just, we can't determine where those are right at this point. So summary, late warm, late winter and early spring, giving way to cooler in the spring that led to some of the freeze issues that we saw. Uh, largely drier west and wetter east, a lot of variability in that. Uh, double freeze did do damage, a lot of specialty crop issues. We're still collecting that information, uh, but there has been some problems already. Um, spring dryness did help other ag planting, that's a good thing. And Great Lakes issues are still with us and likely gonna stay with us. And then uh, recent flooding has, has caused localized serious issues uh, and going to be support water going back into the lakes for a while. 
Uh, we, I, I didn't mention we had been kind of still on marginal El Nino status, uh, transitioning to, to heading towards the La Nina territory, but still staying very much in the neutral standpoint, uh, still officially neutral, and the lack of indications one way or the other is, impacts the outlooks. Uh, warm, likely far east, June in, into summer. Um, increased chance of wetness throughout much of the region, June and the summer. And then that drought ongoing in the plains probably is going to stay with us at this point. Hard to make up for much for at this time of year. Uh, okay, last piece, Atlantic hurricane season. Um, just released today, uh, expecting a bit more active. Um, you know, 60% chance of above normal active and a very small chance of being a below normal. Uh, so that is a concern given the other ongoing issues we have with COVID uh, to add a level of complexity with uh, the addition of, of the ongoing flooding right now in the Midwest and then potential for Atlantic hurricanes, you know, it's gonna stretch those resources even more. If you want more information, there's a NOAA release that talks about this. Okay, again, partners, that's what we're all about here, working with partners. Uh, you can find information from a number of those folks. Here are the people that we collaborate with most closely and you want additional information for them. And then one last one here, just a, a, an ode and thank you to a couple of, of our colleagues, the Midwest Climate Hub, Erica Kissner thomas our fellow, and Shari Queen Oakley, our coordinator, are moving on to, to other opportunities, one with NOAA and one with USDA. We wish them well. Thank you, Dennis. Um, can you go back to, <laughs> I'm going to go right here, I want to go quickly back, way back to the very beginning of your uh, slides where you were talking about the state uh, departures from state rankings. Got it. Uh, temperature of, precipitation. Of, that's a good one. Right okay. there. So there's basically okay. a question uh, on interpretation of these. And, um, um, well, actually go down to the April or uh, February through April. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So the question was, uh, Nebraska looks like it has a 96 there, February, April, and that was that was that was that leans toward the warmer side of the 126 years of record. Um, so the question was, are we talking about in, in 126 years? Does that also make um, February through April the 29th coolest? And no, no, that that basically means um, out of the 126 years, this was if you ranked them from top to bottom, being 126 being the hottest and number one being the coldest, this was much closer to the 126 than it was from the one. Hope that makes sense to you. So we're on the high high side of uh, high side of the scale, if that makes sense. So if you look at Florida, 126, it has never been warmer. There is no warmer for Florida. For February, March, and April on record. Okay, I hope that I hope that clears it up a little bit. Yeah, and and this doesn't try to account for changes in climate. This just ranks them flat out and says where yeah. does this rank? Yep. Right. Right. Yeah, it takes the whole record into account. Um, uh, are there delayed crop delayed crop progress development concerns? Um, delayed crop progress development concerns like there were in 2019. Dennis? Um, there are a few in our northern areas. Just slide down here to say corn. Parts of South Dakota, especially parts of North Dakota, a little bit of Minnesota, there are some delays. But we are, you know, um, you know, the, the corn planted progress, we are nationally 9% ahead of the five-year average. So we're way ahead of last year and even way ahead of the five-year average. So there are pockets of delayed, of concern. Um, I think you are going to see more people this year go, it's too late. I, I remember what happened when I planted late last year. They're going to take their crop insurance settlement from prevent plants and go on. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with that. We'll see what happens with additional precipitation. But from a larger scale perspective, no, there are not, and there are not large scale concerns. Okay. Um, 
And then um, some of this, uh, especially on these kinds of gra uh, graphics, there was concern that we couldn't read the numbers. Is there a place, is there a URL you can stick somewhere? I, and I don't remember, honestly. I know we get these from USDA, but I don't, don't know if they're online or whatever for people to look at in other times, other places. Um, a shameless self-plugging. Self I uh, know there are not. These are created within the USDA apps. The chief economist shared with us by a, a colleague named Brad Rippey, who's very collaborative. They um, do not, are not allowed to put these out. So he shares them with me. We use them for this. I tweet them almost every week when I get them, but there are not, there are not maps like this that, that you can go to USDA and get. You can go and get the data from two places. There is a state by state report. You can grab it state by state. Or Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday of each week, there is a weekly weather and crop bulletin. You can find this data on in, in, in a tabular format, not a graphical format like this. Okay. All right. Um, it was just pointed out that this is um, key information that. Uh, um, yeah, and, and one graphic per slide. The problem with it is if we put one graphic per slide, it turns into a, well, it, it becomes a longer presentation. <laughs> now, these will be available uh, via PDF uh, online, and I think with the invitation that we sent out, and maybe, Dennis, you can go to that uh, final slide or whatever it is that has the place to go download these. Do, do, do. Second to the third to last. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. And and highlight yep. them maybe real quick. They're uh, right at the top there. And if you if you want the PDF yeah. of these slides or listen to this recording because because Dennis's voice is so nice you could listen to it again. Um, it will the be in the same location. Silky smooth tones of Dennis Toddy. Yes, you just can't get enough of it. I know. Okay. <laughs> uh, I got to keep going here. Could you discuss yep. where there are prevent plant concerns? I think maybe you got into this a little bit. Uh, up north yeah. or a yeah. couple other places. Right. Um, north Dakota, particularly, parts of South Dakota, uh, maybe a little bit of Minnesota. There will probably be pockets in other parts of states, um, not anything uh, major other than North Dakota and a little bit of South Dakota. Okay. Um, and we're, we're, still, we're still not, uh, you know, the, that decision – now, we are getting close. We're getting toward the end of May now. Um, so that we, we are getting closer to that decision time. Okay. Um, there was a note that the mid-May IRI CPC outlook for El Nino uh, did a flip. And I, I've been looking for it. I couldn't find it. Um, the latest that we have in the official word is that chances of El Nino coming back is, is, is relatively small. Uh, no matter what the mid-month says, I think it's the beginning of the month. I'm trying to remember which one we we seem to care more about. But anyway, the mid. We, uh, yeah, go ahead. We care more. We care more about the early month one. The early the one. Mid month okay. one is, I, I think, is only model, and there's not any human interaction. I believe that's the case. Okay. Uh, yeah. Several people who watched this have said, kind of ignore the middle month one. It's an update, yeah. but it's it it doesn't have much interaction. But but anyway, um, the I, I guess the, the key message here is that we are also in a period of the year. I know this may sound crazy to everybody, but sort of the March, April, May, especially as you get into May, April, May, um, the prediction of El Nino or La Nina gets super fuzzy. And until we sort of emerge out of what we call a um, spring barrier uh, for various better for, for lack of a better way to say it um, we'll start having a much better idea next month on which way the ocean is deciding to go I'm giving it some anthropomorphic uh, uh, ability and, there and Doug yep. Doug one more quick thing that uh, I think it is the case if you look at the since 1950 only once have we gone during a growing season from neutral conditions to La Nina and that's where we are right now officially. It's still neutral conditions, unless that gets reevaluated. Um, only once have we gone that way. Several times we've gone from El Nino to La Nina, pretty quick transition, but we don't have good analogs 
you know, of, of this only happening once. So that's right. why there's there's some skepticism about being able to transition as quickly to anemia. Right. And and the impact on that uh, impact on our neck of the woods um, is is really a tough call right now. So I'll just say that. Um, anyway, uh, another question about. Uh, <laughs> Is there a concern about a very wet pattern developing again over the Midwest? And I think when we say again, meaning like 2019 or even 2018, and um, I'll simply say, uh, is there concern? I would say there's always concern, but uh, I, I certainly not like the last two years now. I know Dennis uh, mentioned July, or sorry, Chicago setting records for three years in a row at O'Hare, which has a long period of record. Um, for May, um, is that the shape of things to come? Golly, I, I hope not. And uh, Dennis, do, do you want to comment on that? Um, I don't think we have indications of big shifts toward big precipitation. The outlooks did lean towards the wet side. The other side we have to think of too is what are the pre pre-existing situations. Last year we were wet after being wet you know, very wet coming in. Uh, we've dried things out a lot this spring. Soil moisture does have a bit more capacity. Rivers have a decent amount of capacity right now. So that even if we did get wet, it would not be as problematic. If you get those big rainfalls like Chicago and Michigan have seen, then it doesn't matter when that happens, that's still a problem. Um, right. But our larger scale situation, we're a little bit better set if we were to turn wet. Right, yeah, we're in a much better position. That is the, oh, wait a minute, let me make sure. That, I believe, is the end of uh, questions. And um, Dennis, do you have anything else you'd like to say at this time? You got me at a loss. I got nothing else to say. Yeah. Oh, could you please show uh, where the, oh, um, yeah, so I don't know if, I'm not sure we have a place. To, I, I don't know if we can show a map, Patrick, of where the dams actually broke. We have some pictures somewhere. Uh, I don't think they're part of your presentation, but it's it's pretty. It looks terrible. <laughs> um, uh, what was the? It's a Midland. Well, if you can find, yeah, I, well, here's what I would say to you: Google or Google Maps Midland, uh, Michigan, and you'll you'll see the area at least. And I think it flows east into Huron. That's my guess. Uh, it it flows, I think, if I saw, it flows south a little bit into the Saginaw River and then into Huron after that. But yeah. if you can see my cursor, it's kind of this area of Michigan, uh, kind of northeastern Michigan uh, is where the, the situation is. Um, you can also go to the National Weather Service website and I believe it's the Lansing office uh, cover has responsibility. They show some of that area on on their graphics. Yep. Hey, um, any chance of uh, we got a, a, a drought question here about flash drought uh, focused on the northern plains? And I think we got to be sort of careful where we choose uh, to talk about the northern plains because it's. Some places remain crazy wet, lake levels never higher. Uh, and I'm not talking about Great Lakes in this case, I'm just talking about uh, glacial lakes and, and prairie lakes and such being never higher. Uh, but <laughs> it would it could happen it, even in those areas that uh, we get some extreme heat. We don't see that in the next two weeks. In fact, the next two weeks, I guess Desert, Dennis didn't show the hazards, but the Hazards over the next uh, week two are in the southwest for being really hot. And so, as you all probably know, it takes a lot to be super hot or be extreme hot in the desert southwest, southwest this time of year. So don't ask me what the temperatures are going to be. Um, just don't go there. <laughs> that would be my recommendation. Uh, we, you know, there's there's nothing in any of the forecasts, long range forecasts that are sort of pointing towards um, expansive record heat. Some heat's coming back this weekend. Uh, I think it's, I don't know if it's short lived or not, but it looks like it's not gonna last a long time, but it's certainly not crazy heat either. Um, 
Dennis, anything you want to say yeah. about flash droughts? Well, I yeah, like I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I'm, let's see, let's pull this up here. We talked about you know the the western high plains. Their peak precipitation time is about now, and we're not getting a ton of additional precipitation right now. So they are going to go in somewhat dry to the main part of summer. So there is obviously some risk. The drought outlook map did talk about southwest, I believe southwest North Dakota. Was right, parts of eastern North Dakota, parts of eastern, northeastern South Dakota are still quite wet uh, and have some wetness issues. So uh, there is some contrast there. And yeah, then down in Colorado, Kansas area, we have problems already that are not going to resolve, very unlikely to resolve as the summer goes on. Yeah, and I'll point out in 2017, we had plenty of water in most of the rivers in the upper plain, upper northern plains and western plains, yet it was a severe D4 drought around those rivers. So it can happen even though you have plenty of flow, if you will, in the major rivers. It's it's just, just part of the geography. Um, yeah, and, and I would say also, yeah, we're coming into that time of year where flash drought is obviously much easier to uh, create due to the warm temperatures and uh, a lot of uh, wind and all that kind of business. Nothing on the horizon yet. Um, we'll see in June. Um, again, we'll have a better idea of where those things might be materializing. So um, I guess thank you all. And we look forward to uh, having you back in June, June 18th, uh, when we get another perspective on all of this. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dennis or I or me, and um, um, we we can try and help you. So thank you very much. Oh. Yeah, Dennis? Thank you. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Always fun to be here. Yep. Bye-bye.